I had a good life. I'd had uh, measuring it by material world, and I'd had 26 Cadillacs in a row. And that's one way of saying, you know, I had 26 Jaguars in a row or something like that. I wasn't allowed to have a, uh, have a car while I was in school by my parents. They didn't want, you know, want me too distracted. So I used their big packards and things like that when I needed wheels. But when I got out of school, I, I, I bought uh, my first Cadillac right away. And with my own money, money I had earned. And my father had disciplined me to, you know, go forth and conquer and, you know, little jobs, this, that, and the other thing. But and so that was good. That was fine. That was wonderful. It was a joy and a, a nice car, too. But uh, then they were so economical that they were the best car to drive. It was really a simple decision. And then we discovered that people like to do business with people who are successful. And it's hard to determine who's successful uh, by simple standards, so they apply an obvious standard. What kind of a car does he drive? And so driving a Cadillac said that everything to everybody that they needed to know that I was successful enough to do that. And uh, that actually was a business tool, a beautiful one. Along the line, I had Mercedes and uh, a couple of BMWs, but uh, the Cadillac was the mainstay. And that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed those cars very much. But I enjoy Jaguars now very much, too. And in any event, I had a, a couple of three houses that were 3,500 square feet, 3,000 feet, 2,900 feet, which were very nice homes on nice pieces of property. And the last house that I had was 2,800 square feet on an acre of land that was landscaped. That was nice. I belonged to several of the clubs, the private clubs in the area. Uh, outstandingly, a, a yacht club, which is uh, the most sophisticated club in the town from the standpoint of hard to get into and tight rules. Uh, traveled well, did everything well. We had a good life. I was raised, I had lost my wife to a mental illness that she had acquired, which was not really her fault. This was something that had been there since childhood. And uh, I became a single parent raising three kids, beautiful three children and uh, two girls and a boy. And my, they're, this is years later, they're successful, married, and doing very well out into the world. And my son is in the investment business, doing very well. And the girls are doing well. They're both entrepreneurs. And they're both, one of them's in the financial world and the other one's in uh, 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 building out a uh, huge, uh, I mean a huge, data recovery and recording system for uh, international law firms. Uh, this is something that they own software. She and her husband own the software for it. So everything went well. And uh, we lived on the top. We didn't live on the bottom of life. I took my children on vacations. And we... I always stayed at the best hotels, and we had the finest foods, and, you know, and then occasionally we'd go slumming, but we had a lot of fun, but we always were real people. We never lost track of who we were that way, and from a spiritual point of view, I could not have done it had I not had some belief uh, system, and Christianity was a belief system that got me through it, uh, raising the three kids, running businesses, and traveling, et cetera. But uh, it, it, towards the end, it was getting a little insane. I did one trip. I went. I had to be in New York, and I had to be in Dallas, believe it or not, in the same day. And Dallas, Texas, is a long way from New York. And I was leaving from the West Coast, so I mounted an airplane at 12.30 in the morning on the West Coast. And I flew to Chicago and got there at 6 in the morning. I landed in Newark, at uh, New, in New York, uh, at 9.30 in the morning or 10.30 in the morning, 11.30, and about 11.30 in the morning. No, about 9.30 in the morning it was. And uh, I was driven, I was picked up, chauffeured into New York City, had my business meeting and a quick lunch, and back out to the airport. Flew from New York to Dallas. I was in Dallas, 6.30, 7 o'clock their time and had a quick meeting at the airport there, got the papers signed I needed to do, and flew back into Seattle. In about 24 hours, I'd circumnavigated the, the American country. 
that kind of craziness, though, that it was catching up with me. It, 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 it was interesting. I mean, a real insurance company is not like an agency or brokerage. It's a, but a subsidiary of an insurance company, national insurance company. And uh, in practical terms, I was uh, swindled, I guess, is the word that everybody would understand. They had cooked their books. And some of the representations, I was able to survive the money part of it, but some of the representations they'd made as to where they stood with all the legal um, insurance commissioners and all the places we needed approvals from and whatnot, the, the, those were false. Uh, they didn't have what they said they had. They didn't have what I was buying. And um, it, it became quite um, contentious. And we ended up in court, one thing and another, and we were winning, but we weren't winning what we needed to win in terms of actually having a product for sale that we could actually complete what what the purpose of the acquisition was. And uh, I was putting in 80 hours a week. I had my own money writing on it. Things Things were very, very contentious. And in doing that, I, my health was degenerating and I wasn't paying any attention to it and uh, basically uh, <clears throat> I thought I was coming down with flu and it wasn't the flu at all I was actually much sicker than that I was going into congestive heart failure and I ended up in the hospital and being diagnosed with congestive heart failure and that doesn't mean that the heart's a bad heart it just means that your body is so polluted uh, with your own body fluids and that the systems of your body is sh are shutting down per imperceptibly to the point where finally you end up with a heart rate was over 200, if you can imagine something like that. I mean, the heart was on the verge of explosion and uh, the blood pressure rates were in the 180s and the 190s. I didn't do anything to protect my health. <clears throat> pressure and stress was part of it, but there were other aspects of my life that were giving me s signs that that were saying that there was a dramatic shift that happened. Up to this point, I'd been kind of like a golden guy, and Midas touch, you know, whatever I did was pretty creative, and I was always able to gather a really good group of talented people around, and we would go, you know, I'd be like the... Uh, like the committee chairman, and we would put money in, and we'd put our talents in, and we'd go out and make some money with it. But I was always the innovator and the and the fellow who came up with it and put it together and organized it and whatnot. But so I I, I drove myself to a hospital, which was some sort of a miracle in the first place. They told me that I they couldn't believe that I actually had a car in the parking garage. But uh, when they looked at me, they admitted me immediately to the hospital. I was at the hospital at 8:30 in the morning and 9:30. By 9.30, I was being looked at by the doctors and examined, and uh, they immediately admitted me to the hospital and put me in the critical care intensive unit for heart. And uh, I have no memory, frankly, uh, of getting in. I, I know they put me in a wheelchair and took me up in the elevator, but I can't remember anything after that. It's gone in terms of the material world. The next thing I know, I'm moving, and I, I've, I've already uh, passed away, and I'm moving towards, I'm moving into heaven, into the heavenly dimensions, and it's, it's, it's as if you go to sleep. You, you cannot describe to me what it was like for you to go to sleep last night. I mean, you just don't have a memory of it remember putting your head on the pillow or whatever but that actual moment when you slip from this dimension to the next you can't recall it exactly but you do become aware of something that's going on and in my case since I had no premonition of, of death or anything like that, I was just totally off the screen uh, I was became aware, my consciousness became aware that I was in a in a space and in a place where I had some sort of movement that was going forward. And in that place, it was 
uh, a very pale peachy color and uh, it was a different thing than than I'd ever I could I could not have imagined and as I was moving this peachy color turned more of a of a reddish and eventually a, a pink color and with that was coming an absolutely awesome feeling of love and of being loved just though it, it was like if you condensed the entire emotion of love and then took a swim in it it was wonderful and i i, I was just completely blown away by it i have no simple words for it it's it was awesome later thinking about that love I came to recognize that I knew that love from when I was with my mother in the womb. It was her love and my love together combined. And then later, rethinking that again, it was always referenced back to that point beyond that, where that was the love emotion that I I had that I brought into her womb. And uh, between the, that's that's what how powerful that love emotion is. And then there, in in holding on to that love emotion, it's moving forward into an apricot color around me. And as that apricot color is around me, there's more of a, a sense of total security, total belonging, totally being a part of something much greater than 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 I was at any point in my in my in my life. And that feeling of belonging uh, was a tremendous sense, uh, almost as compounding as the love was. And as it moved on, it came to another color, sort of a magenta kind of a color. And in that, the sense of purpose, purposefulness accompanied then the sense of belonging and accomplishment and love. And this purposefulness is just as powerful as the love emotion in the sense of being beautiful and wanted and needed and desired. Uh, and at that point, uh, as I was moving on, it became a silvery kind of color around me. With all of these emotions still present and compounding, and as I moved into this silvery kind of an environment, that's when I was approached by three spiritual beings, all of whom knew me well. And uh, they were having a good time. The beautiful thing about all the out-of-body experiences that I've had, in every case, any spiritual being that I ever that, that approached me, or these were all purposeful. As they approached me, they all had a great, wonderful smile on their face. They were like your absolute best friend or best brother or sister. Their love was completely unconditional. And they all had a smile on their face just as if they were about to have a decent laugh or something. That's completely com contrary to to all of the portrayals of judgments and uh, people looking down their nose at people and things like that. They, 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 they look just like people. They... They were taller. The impression is that they were taller than I. Uh, I'm six foot three. They, I would guess, in the eight foot area. <laughs> and uh, there's we we didn't uh, really see any of that as uh, anything. But they they did have like a, amazingly they had like a togas on, like a a modified toga, a modernized toga, if you want to call it that. And they were delightfully happy. They were delightfully happy to be with me, and they were having fun with me in that they were saying, okay, well, you've been on your mission. You've been out there to do your thing. Now you've learned everything that we wanted and needed you to learn in the, in the, spirit, in the real world, in the material world, and now it's time for you to take those lessons and apply them for our spiritual purposes and the real purpose that you're there for. And that seemed mysterious to me because uh, two things I didn't want. One was I didn't want to go back. 
and two, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't see how I could engage and make that segue from uh, the high capitalist to running around uh, doing uh, spiritual work and poverty work and things like that. It was that was something that was going to take. I was on a very fast train. I had lots of liabilities. I had my names on leases. I had my names on contracts. And I couldn't imagine how I could just stop. I really couldn't. I could imagine how I could stay dead because that was a very desirable thing at that point. As you can imagine, it, it would be desirable with all those wonderful emotions and feelings. And uh, they explained to me that one of the reasons things weren't going well at this time, because it was time in the material world, it was time for me to make this segue. So there wasn't much much happening to support what I was doing at that time. Let's say the spirit wasn't supporting it. And uh, the purpose of this transition to death actually was a wake-up call. And uh, I protested that the wake-up call was uh, not going to be anything that I was interested in because I just wanted to, to, to stay in that environment where I was. Interestingly, I was going through a change. They're talking to me as if I'm somebody else. I mean, they're talking about experiences that I'd had in the material world, but they're also reminding me and showing me views of myself as a spiritual being. In other words, that being that I was before I was born into my mother's womb. And that itself had a, had a point to it. And uh, I, I totally accept that because when I came... As a young child, uh, in three, four, five, six, seven years old, there was so much that was totally foreign to me in this material world that I was very fortunate that I had a mother and father that truly loved me. But um, a lot of it didn't make sense. And then when it started making sense, it, the things that made it make sense were at a different level, a totally different level in the material world. It was, it was just amazing. And it, it does today still amaze me about that. So when they told me that I needed to be back to, to fulfill these things, and, and I suggested, well, I just couldn't imagine how I could do it because it would be the equivalent of stepping off of a train going 100 miles an hour. I mean, I, I, I just can't imagine how that would have worked. And uh, But they told me not to worry about it, that it would all be taken care of, and, and that they're watching. So... Not with my real agreement, but they moved me back into my body. And uh, as I came into my body, uh, shortly after that, one of my daughters showed up at the hospital because none of this was programmed and people that had to been called and and brought in. So, and that 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 for that moment uh, brought that out of body experience to a close, as far as being out of body was concerned. But that was only just the very, very, very tip and the very beginning of a whole hundreds of spiritual experiences that I would have while I was in body as well. And in the hospital that night, uh, this was happening in the morning, and, uh, and in the hospital that night, I had a real parade of nurses coming through the room. And now I don't <clears throat> didn't know if that was a lot of nurses or a few nurses, but it was a lot of nurses were coming through the room. And this one nurse took the time and she says, do you know why we're coming through? And I, I said, well, I don't, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. She says, well, a number of the nurses are coming through. We all know what you've been through. We all know that you, you traveled. And we have seen this before and others. And she pointed, the room was darkened. I had a, there wasn't a, there was just a little nightlight that was on. And she pointed me to the wall on the bed, next to the bed where I was. And the wall had a bluey shoe to it. It was just amazing. All kinds of things happened continuously after that. A few months later, I was in that hospital again, and one of the nurses who had been my nurse during that time was going past me. I was in for uh, another kind of a procedure and not very recognizable in the event that I was in. And she walked past the foot of the bed. She stopped. She came back. She came right up to me and called me by name. They memorized who I was, and they followed me for a long time on their paper trails. It's an amazing time. 
So what we have now is an opening. That became an opening, and uh, the door never shut again. The door is open right now. So it's like if you dialed someplace and kept an open line for the rest of your life with it. You don't have to die to have this kind of communication. You have to open to it. Whatever means the opening comes to you, whether that be a physical experience like I had in, in a medical world or some other kind of a thing happened that created this spontaneity, it can happen to everybody. It was solid. It was real. And and obviously I had the validation of, of, of myself going through it. There was nothing that I was involved with that was you know, involved with the, the brain or the emotional pattern. I mean, I was a sick person, and that's the heart stopped, and that's what killed me. But it didn't have anything to do with, you know, anything that would have generated a, a hallucination or anything of that nature. Particularly, I would point to the fact that I had no predisposition to it. I had no fear of death. I had no predisposition to be dead. You know, there was none of that was there. The... the the desire to stay dead, that's, that happened after the occurrence. But uh, I, I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't anticipating it. And I didn't see it as anything to do. I had three you know, wonderful children that still needed their dad. I'd lost my dad when I was 21. And in some sense, I was going to duplicate that experience for my children. And that was not a good thing to do at least not for me. So I had no predisposition to be dead at all, nothing. I mean, there's, there's literally nothing that, that, that could point to that. It's a very interesting thing happens. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a Christian, you know, and I'd been on a, attended a few churches and been on the finance committee. They always liked me to sit on their finance committee because finance committee chairman is supposed to put in a few thousand dollars just because he's a chairman and stuff like that. But in real terms, no, no, we had no predisposition whatsoever towards it. The, the, the Christian part was a, a, a non-Catholic Christian, but a Christian still. And it was, you know, so I had a Christ-centered environment, and I believe that I'd had miracles in my life to that point, uh, more social miracles than physical miracles in the raising of the children. But there was there was something even more remarkable when in that first night I was laying in that bed, uh, there was a feminine presence, spiritual feminine presence with me, and uh, this physical female was speaking intuitively to me in a voice that intuitively I could hear, and uh, it was gorgeous. And I came to understand that that was somehow a representation of of, uh, of uh, Mother Mary. This was a Catholic hospital, but uh, it was awesome. Uh, it was comfort and joy and peace, and that I could never have manifested <laughs> for a lot of reasons at that time. Now, I now when I'm asking for an intercessory prayer, which I do from time to time, now I will ask, in addition to some other people that I've got on the other side, I would ask uh, Mother Mary to intercede for me, and... Uh, to this day, I still believe that she, not only was she there then, but she's been at least to that level once or twice more with me where there was some manifestation uh, of her actual voice. A lot of people run really hard to make a lot of money. That's their their obsession, if you want to call it that. In other words, the material world is everything, and that's their they're demigod for a while. And here here I was going the other direction. I was going away from it. And to them that was, you know, they just couldn't get their hands around it very easily. Uh, I would tell them the glory and joy of and the wonder of the spirit, but uh, they couldn't really accept that that was something that was, I mean, these 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 people. Well, they were nice people. They were good people uh, as persons, 
uh, they just couldn't do it, given a choice of a few million dollars in their pocket or um, you know, uh, not and going to church instead, uh, they would take the money and run. And so they were they were very confused about the whole issue, even though I had explained it. But again, there was no no uh, conversations in society, and nobody understood the out of body experiences at those times. There was no you know uh, literature that they could go get their hands on. And that was fine. I was, I was delighted with it because I was I was gone. I mean that was it. After I had the auto body experience, I didn't hang around and 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 do things like that. The offices we got to close the offices, got off the leases, and and just kept moving until it all until we got it all cleaned out. And they 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 had a difficult time with it. And uh, for a while, for the first couple of three years, there were people that kept coming around. Come on, Gordy, let's get you know, let's get rich some more and yada, yada, yada. I'd made a lot of money for a lot of people, and myself included, but a lot of other people had also profited, and uh, that was nice. But when they finally realized that I really wasn't going to do it, uh, then that brought some in, uh, 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 some of the people were a little bit bitter about it. Uh, they had, you know, their, 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 their motivation was greed. My motivation was spirituality, uh, two to- totally different things. Two completely different things. There's a, a very interesting uh, writing that I did at that time, which is a very short piece, but just putting it down on paper so I wouldn't forget it about how 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 much the financial world just dominated these other people. Then they 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 uh, you know they'd they'd move on and do other things, but it was to the point I was I had enough visibility in the world i'd been featured in in a lot of news uh, publications and financial publications and stuff like that and i i dealt at the highest levels so a lot of people knew who i was but they weren't leaving me alone so i finally uh, decided i would just uh, you know go slow down my everything and and uh that I was doing, helping unwind stuff, and I just went on the spiritual talk trail. I traveled up and down uh, the United States, uh, West Coast, and into Canada, and and I eventually did uh, that uh, seven or eight months of lectures in 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 London, the Greater London area, in the UK, up in Wales. And uh, by the time I came came back from the first one of those that we did, we did another one. We did two of them. And I, over the years, have lectured up and down the coast here, on the West Coast. Uh, people got the message that this was for real. It took two years, really, to hammer it, but the third year is the one that we really needed to have happen. But then we quit hearing from them. Well, at times, we had a small organization of about 30-some-odd people here and there and everywhere, unpaid volunteer staff. <coughs> And uh, the goal wasn't to build uh, a big organization at that time. The goal was to be of service. The goal was to put the word out. The goal was to convey not only my experience, but how that experience translates to the average person and how that average person then can have a better life, not only a material life here, but a life that prepares them for their ultimate transition back into the spirit. And in, once they've got to that level, then they can have true peace, joy, and happiness here. And they can let go a little bit. It's the freely given charity of yourself to others, even anonymously, preferably anonymously. You know, you're not out there to build up a checkbook you're in heaven. Uh, in a lot of the old-fashioned Christ, Christian things, they were... They were teaching, well, I'm build, building my account in heaven. I'm building my castles in heaven. I'm building my gold in heaven. There's a lot of old Christian songs and stuff on that level. That's how it was presented for a long time, and that's how a lot of people still perceive it. Well, if I go over here and open the door for the little old lady, I'll get a half of a percent. Or if I let this guy through in traffic when I don't have to, um, I'll get a half a percent, or you know, if I help out my neighbor somehow, I want you know something for it. That's not charity. Anything that's motivated by the concept that you're gaining 
is not charity. It's no longer a charity of yourself. So the charity of yourself, the true charity of yourself, is is at least anonymous in the sense of the motivation. I mean, obviously, you can't be totally anonymous. I, I've met with people who have, have carried that to a degree that was not very functional and that they found ways to direct money to people through others and stuff like that so they weren't shown anywhere. Well, that is a form of being anonymous, but it, 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 being anonymous isn't the overall criteria. The criteria is to get their need met. That's the number one criteria. The second criteria is that your motivation to get that person's need met is a motivation of simply help, love. It's a it's a brother or sister help, like you would for a brother or a sister. You're not going to ask the brother and sister that you did something for them. Now they've got to do something for you. And it's not even so specific as that person. You give because you you it's that's your commandment. That's your personal commandment. I'm I'm giving of myself freely, the charity of myself in either in my labor or goods or whatever it is that I'm doing, not for the motivation of reward. I'm doing it because that is who I am at my center core being. I'm doing that in my love being with Christ.